All right, so today I'm going to talk about Kubernetes, which Sanjeeva mentioned earlier in his presentation. <coughs> so the old way to deploy applications is to install them on the host. So the applications and the operating system would share the file system. Use the application would be installed using the operating system distributions package manager, typically. Uh, and this would cause the applications to become entangled with each other and with the host. Uh, the executables, configuration, the shared libraries, process management, uh, would all use the host's mechanisms for these things. <coughs> and you could achieve uh, immutable deployments for predictability of rollouts and rollbacks by installing these things into a virtual machine image instead of onto the physical host. But virtual machine images are not portable, and they're very heavyweight. <coughs> so not a lot of people do that. Uh, so the new way to deploy applications is with containers. Uh, containers are an operating system level virtualization mechanism, um, but they, the containers are still isolated from each other and from the host. Uh, the file systems, the processes don't see each other. Uh, resources can be contained, uh, like CPU and memory and, and other physical resources. Uh, but containers, unlike virtual machine images, are small and fast. And what that really enables is to pack one application into each container image. And that bun tying together the application and container is what really unlocks the benefits of microservices. Uh, it enables you to actually build your immutable uh, deployment artifact at, at build time instead of deployment time, which enables you to actually decouple development from operations uh, more completely and carry a consistent environment all from development all the way into production. The container images that you build can also be portable across operating system distributions and across clouds from uh, laptop to on-prem to public clouds like Google or Amazon or Azure. Uh, and also coupling the uh, one application to each container image really empowers you to manage um, your infrastructure as if you can manage your application directly. Uh, rather than having to orchestrate it through various other mechanisms uh, together with your infrastructure orchestration. But <clears throat> while decoupling the applications from the, the physical or virtual hosts has a lot of benefits, it also means that your managed infrastructure that's host-centric no longer is sufficient. You need container-centric infrastructure. You need scheduling to decide where to actually run the containers, you need lifecycle and health management that knows how to deal with containers, scaling to create more containers or delete containers, uh, naming discovery, load balancing, storage, logging, monitoring, de debugging, and introspection. There's a whole suite of mechanisms that people are, are used to getting from an infrastructure as a service platform um, that is modeled as virtual hardware. You need all new mechanisms to really get the benef full benefits from using containers. And not only do you need container-centric infrastructure, but everybody wants to be able to deploy features faster. They want to be able to grow faster. Um, so they need automation for their particular use case. Uh, so rolling updates, configuration distribution, continuous integration and deployment, batch processing, and so on. So no matter how much functionality you provide, there's always more automation that you can add that's specific to your particular scenario. <clears throat> a lot of times, uh, ad hoc orchestration is sufficient when you start out, but as you grow, you really need automation in order to, uh, in order to keep up the pace of development. So what you need is a platform, and that platform needs to be composable and extensible so you can build whatever it is that you need for your application. So that's where Kubernetes comes in. Kubernetes is Greek for helmsman. Uh, if you know Docker, you know that there are a lot of shipping analogies uh, in the Docker ecosystem. <clears throat> it's also the root of the word cybernetic, which we think is appropriate. So Kubernetes provides infrastructure for containers. Uh, it schedules, runs, and manages containers on clusters of virtual and physical hosts. Uh, it's also a platform for automating deployment, scaling, and operations um, for application um, applications that are packaged in containers. And I'm going to talk about in what ways Kubernetes enables that. 
Uh, and then Kubernetes it was inspired by Google systems, as was mentioned. I previously worked on Borg and Omega, which are Google's internal projects providing this. We've talked about how we launch billions of containers every week uh, inside Google. Uh, so we have a lot of experience doing this. The big difference is Kubernetes is all open source. It was written from scratch in Go and is being built with the community. We have over 500 contributors. <clears throat> so here's just a quick example of what r using Kubernetes looks like. We have a command line tool called kubectl. You can just say kubectl run, and here's my container image. Uh, and then you can also use the command line tool to see it running. Uh, you can use the command line tool similarly to scale your application. Um, and the containers start in seconds, not in, in minutes, as is, is the case with virtual machines on some cloud platforms. <clears throat> and you can use it to do other uh, management operations as well, such as tearing down your application. OK, so how does Kubernetes work? The command line tool I just showed you, or uh, GUIs or other API clients, talk to the control plane via an API. Uh, the control plane manages a set of nodes with the help of an agent that runs on each node that we call the kubelet. <clears throat> the user uh, submits their request to run uh, their application to the control plane, in this case, uh, Nginx, which is a web server load balancer, reverse proxy. Uh, you can specify how many replicas you want, how much CPU and memory, and a bunch of other attributes uh, for how to execute it. The control plane dis then decides where to run those containers, uh, and they're assigned to particular nodes. And from that point on, the execution of those containers is delegated to the agent on the nodes. And th those agents on the nodes can continue to manage those containers, even if the network becomes unavailable. <coughs> uh, the kubelets then uh, pull the images down to the machine and start executing it. They manage the, the lifecycle and the health of the containers and report back the current status to the control plane. The user can then find out what the current status is by, again, invoking the command line tool, as I told you, or using the API directly uh, <coughs> to find out what that current status is. Uh, so not only, do, um, not only does the user or clients like the command line client or the UI use the API, but Kubernetes itself uses the API. And this is what really opens up the platform. Kubernetes is actually comprised of microservices itself. These microservices use the API. There are no shortcuts or backdoors. Uh, and this keeps us honest, ensures that people can build the kind of automation they need against the system. Uh, so we really uh, strive to keep the system modular, composable, extensible. Um, one pattern that we use in order to achieve this is control loops. So all of the components, like the scheduler, the controllers, that uh, I'll talk more about later. They use the APIs uh, and the control plane as a way to keep track of what the desired state is that is expressed by the user or by other clients. Um, and they record their observations, and they continuously drive the observed state towards the desired state. Um, and while people talk about container orchestration systems, I don't really like to use that term. Orchestration is really a limiting uh, solution. It actually means execution of a defined workflow, do A, then B, then C. Kubernetes uh, mostly does not use that p pattern, except at the fringes. Instead, it uses uh, something called choreography, where the uh, different components act independently uh, using control loops, which provides a much more robust platform. So uh, I'll talk a little bit about the Kubernetes core primitives, which were also mentioned in my introduction. Uh, pods, the term comes from uh, peas in a pod or a pod of whales. Uh, and what it is is it's, it's a small, tightly coupled group of containers and volumes. And I think of it as a, a logical host uh, for those containers. The developer um, or the operator can decide what containers should run together, and those containers get deployed as a group. They get managed as a group, scheduled as a group. Uh, each pod gets an IP address. So just as if you were packing, hand packing the containers on a physical or virtual host, you can pick uh, what ports you want to use. The pod gets an IP address. Uh, the pods can share data just if, as if they were on a physical or virtual host via volumes or local communication, IPC, and so on. And 
what pods do is they facilitate composite applications. You can mix and max um, components, languages, OS distributions, and so on, uh, and pr preserve this one-to-one -one application to image model, which really gives you much more powerful uh, management capabilities. Uh, so a typical example of that might be a content management system or a data puller uh, and a web server that displays that content. <clears throat> so volumes is the other important piece in addition to containers. Um, most applications uh, actually require some amount of storage, even if it's just a place to put logs. Um, so it's really a key building block for higher level automation. Uh, you don't actually want to rebuild orchestration of tying together storage and your compute in every higher level uh, orchestration or automation mechanism that you build. So Kubernetes does that for you. It can create scratch directories uh, on demand, or it can attach uh, cloud block storage or cluster block storage or file storage to your pod. We also have some special volumes like you can uh, automatically de uh, deploy a Git repository, clone a Git repository into your pod, or secrets, which I'll talk about next, uh, which can be used to grant access to other things from your application. So you don't want to actually bake credentials, tokens, passwords, and so on into your container images. Uh, you don't actually even want to put them into your pod specification. Um, you want to keep your secrets secure and inject them sort of at the last minute. Uh, uh, we, Kubernetes will keep the secrets in memory. They don't touch disk. And unlike with virtual machines, uh, they're accessed via a standard file API instead of a proprietary metadata API, which is what keeps the containers portable. Uh, so another key primitive is labels. And labels are user-provided key value attributes. Uh, they generally represent identity, and it's what we use to group things using selectors. You can think of it similar to SQL queries. Uh, for example, you might have a set of attributes on your pods um, identifying the application, what release track it's in, what tier it is, uh, and then you can specify a selector to sp select all the pods in your application, uh, just the front end, just the back end. Uh, for example, you might want to deploy uh, an updated configuration to, to your back end or your front end, or you could select your stable release track or your canary, for example, if you want to tear down your canary instances because they're causing some kind of problem in production. So labels are used by the user directly to manage their application. They can also be used to tell the system how to manage sets of containers on your behalf. So we ha Kubernetes has a, an API called Replication Controller. And its job is just to ensure that it keeps a certain number of copies of the pod running at all times. If there are too few, it starts new ones. If there are too many, it kills some. Uh, and the, the set of pods is identified by a label selector. Uh, this is different than how some other systems work in that there's an explicit representation of how many instances you actually want. And this is actually critical for self-healing if pods fail or, or get killed or deleted for any reason, they get replaced. Uh, it also facilitates auto-scaling. Like, how do you actually build an auto-scaler to create new pods if there's no concept of what template it is you want to create the pods from or uh, how many are actually running or should be running at any given time? <clears throat> and I mentioned controllers before when I showed the, uh, the picture of the architecture. Uh, so this is one example of that, and again, it just calls, the implementation just calls the public APIs. So you, it's straightforward to build new controllers, and I'll talk about some other controllers that we've built later. Uh, so a group of pods that works together uh, or provides some service to the end user or to actually another tier of your application, uh, we have an API for that called service. And again, the set of pods that comprise the service is identified by a label selector. Uh, <coughs> Uh, a service has a DNS name published for it. We also publish SRV records for the ports, although because we allocate an IP address to every pod and uh, to a service if you want it, you can also just continue to use well-known ports. Uh, <clears throat> we also have a, an endpoints API, which is useful for building uh, some additional automation. 
And the service also defines the access policy. Uh, if you specify that you want your uh, service to be load balanced, then a virtual IP is allocated for you, and Kubernetes will do the load balancing uh, for you for any traffic sent to that DNS name or virtual IP. Uh, you can also have a headless set for distributed applications <coughs> where uh, you can find out the, the IPs of all the pods uh, in your service. And this model, unlike uh, systems which dynamically allocate different ports to every, every container or that you heavily use uh, NAT to remap ports, uh, the Kubernetes model is much more straightforward and easier to run legacy applications um, that would otherwise have been installed on physical or virtual hosts. Uh, so once you have an application that you deployed using a replication controller as a service, a common thing you want to do is actually update that service in place without uh, taking it out of service. So Kubernetes provides a mechanism for that we call rolling updates. And again, you can do that through the command line tool. You can roll out a new uh, version of your application, for example. <coughs> Uh, and what it does is it creates, uh, Kubernetes will create a new replication controller, and it will gradually scale that up while scaling the old one down. And at any given time, you still have your full capacity available. And it makes sure, Kubernetes will make sure that uh, it doesn't actually uh, take down your service. It monitors the health of the application as it replaces the individual instances. Um, so as I mentioned before, uh, the, since we built the controllers using the same API available to, uh, available to the user, uh, that makes it straightforward to add new controllers to the system. And that's what we've done in the latest release uh, that will be out in a couple of weeks, which is 1.1. So replication controllers manage continuously running services with a uh, specified number of replicas. Like I said, if any pod uh, fails or is deleted for any reason, it gets replaced. Another common s use case that people have is that they actually want to run some workload to completion. Uh, so we have a, a different API for that, which we call job. And, j and uh, you can think of jobs sort of similar to a thread pool in that there's a maximum number of uh, instances that you want to run simultaneously and a certain number of uh, tasks that you want to complete. So we created a new API for this rather than overloading the existing API because that's a pattern we want to encourage again to really empower people to build on Kubernetes as a platform and add the kind of automation that they need. Uh, so jobs would be used for things like uh, batch workloads, workflow, uh, build and test. <coughs> And the, uh, unlike replication controller, the job will not just simply restart the instances. Instead, it will monitor uh, termination of the, the pods when their containers are finished, and uh, then replace those as long as there are more tasks to execute. Uh, and it will continue that process. If one fails instead of succeeds, uh, then what the job does depends on the restart policy. If it's a test and the test fails, you probably don't want to restart it. On the other hand, if it's a batch workload and it fails for some random reason, you probably want to try again. So depending on that policy, it will either treat it as a completion or it will replace it and try again uh, until all of them are finished. Uh, an another controller we've added in 1.1 is the daemon set. So daemon set, again, is similar to replication controller, but for a slightly different scenario. Daemon set allows you to run a pod on every node or a selected set of nodes, which are specified, again, by a label selector. And it doesn't have a fixed number of replicas. Instead, the daemons are um, created and destroyed as the nodes themselves come and go. <coughs> And what this is typically used for is for creating cluster-wide services, like to put a logging agent on every node or a storage system on every node to make the storage available to the cluster. Uh, interestingly, daemon set is both a controller and a scheduler since it creates pods to run on specific nodes. Uh, so again, that's where Kubernetes, um, because the schedulers and controllers just use 
uh, a standard API, you can build mechanisms like this on top in a pretty straightforward way. Uh, so we've taken uh, in 1.1 1 .1 also uh, rolling updates to the next level. So rolling updates right now are actually orchestrated from the command line client. Uh, what we found is that uh, people building uh, CI CD solutions uh, or want to uh, manage their configuration of their application declaratively actually want the rolling update to be performed on the server side. So that's what we've done. We built a new controller we call deployment. Uh, and you just update the configuration of your pods. And it will handle the rollout. You can use rolling update, as I showed you before. Or you can just say, no, just actually d kill all the pods and recreate them. Um, and it really enables this, this powerful model where you can uh, keep all your configuration for all your Kubernetes resources in source control. Uh, and update that, and then apply those changes to what's running in production. And that's actually how we run all of our services at Google. Uh, and this really makes it easier to integrate with uh, continuous deployment systems like Jenkins, uh, because then they don't have to execute the client that orchestrates the rolling update. They can just, again, update the resource in the server and continue. Uh, so in conclusion, Um, Kubernetes solves problems. Containers have created a number of opportunities, but they've also created challenges, and Kubernetes helps solve that challenges. Um, it provides a container-centric infrastructure, and that provides things like sc scheduling and load balancing and auto-scaling and so on. And it also provides a foundation for building a whole ecosystem for managing the workload. Uh, a number of platform as a service systems have been built on Kubernetes, taking advantage of these capabilities, including Apache Stratos, uh, which people here at WSO2Con may be interested in. Also, OpenShift was three was co-designed and co-developed with Kubernetes, and really feels like a seamless extension of Kubernetes as a result. Uh, Deus is a Heroku-inspired uh, Docker-centric platform as a service system, which is built on Kubernetes now and Gondor, prov which provides uh, Python as a service for Python applications. Um, so anyway, uh, Kubernetes is all open source. Uh, as I said, we rebuilt it from scratch. Uh, so, so we're definitely open to contributions, ideas um, from, from the community. And uh, you can find us on GitHub. Uh, watch for the new 1.1 release. Uh, and uh, that's about it.